He's from the English Channel. Really? Yeah. And I went wow. to this two-hour presentation that he did afterwards, and I sat there the whole time with my mouth open as he's telling the story. It was like a phenomenal experience. Everything he had to go through to set up, go actually get done. Um, he was swimming to raise money for Alzheimer's. His mom suffers from Alzheimer's, and it's like all of this personal motivation. And only a third of the people that even start finish because of currents and weather and all these other things. It was like, holy smokes. I could spend two hours retelling his story. It's really, really That's fascinating. Amazing. So, is this everyone? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, this uh, is Karen. Karen has a, had a client meeting this morning. Okay. Yes. Well, she doesn't everyone. need this class, then. <laughs> she's already got a client meeting. She has six million users, so she's in uh, oh. a little bit of a, But that's not, she still needs a class. Well, but I think. We all, yeah. We're all still there. So um, I guess if we're two minutes early, I can just go ahead and yeah. get going. So thanks everyone for, for introducing yourself. I really appreciate the uh, friendliness. It really helps me. To, to kind of set the stage for what we're going to do today, um, I know some of you are more enterprise focused, like people like Karen are more consumer focused with six million people using the site, I would assume. And rather than um, spend a ton of time going through the differences between enterprise and consumer, the way that I've built the presentation is that while most of my experience, which I'll talk about in a second, focuses on enterprise, I think a lot of the frameworks and the thinking process can apply to, to consumers. The primary difference that I've found in working with some consumer-based companies versus in the enterprise is that the decision process is really the primary difference. Like in an enterprise sale, you have months or even sometimes years between initial introduction and the time of the sale executing. Whereas consumers, you have seconds a lot of times. And surprisingly, psychologically, a lot of the same things happen. The decision framework and the barriers and the consumer decisions that are being made, um, they're just a lot more complex on the enterprise side. So I hope that, that you'll get something out of this. I think you will, regardless of what, what side of the table you're on, whether you're an enterprise or consumer. Um, make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. So one thing that would be helpful is, and I think it would be good practice for you, is I'm sure you're all working on your pitches and um, like give me the 10 second or the 15, 15 second pitch of what you're doing. Because it'll help you to, to, every time you say it, it's good. And it'll help me to make sure that as we're going through the rest of the presentation that I can sort of target ideas to each of you. So whoever wants to go first. Jessica. <coughs> sure. So my company is Lago, and we provide personalized legal services on demand for a flat fee. Um, so the ultimate vision is to disrupt um, historically traditional industries like, like legal, like insurance, um, by empowering the consumer with uh, online tools and uh, on-demand professionals. Got it. And I'm here with my co-founder, uh, Heather John. Oh, okay. <clears throat> okay. Deborah? So I'm uh, in the middle of a pivot, so I don't have it memorized yet, but I'm working on it. So perfect. Uh, so bilingual children's enterprises will help the next billion people coming online to learn English and other languages through high quality, quality animated videos, games, and apps. Okay, cool. And have you thought about whether this could be consumer or more than enterprise, where you're selling to consumer, more consumer? Okay. Yes. And for Jessica and Heather, are you feeling like yours is, I mean, you're, you're targeting specific individuals, right? Yeah, it's, it's very much, uh, we're basically, we're a customer, mm -hmm. we're the customer acquisition business masquerading as a law firm. Mm -hmm. So we sell flat fee lawyers on demand. Um, my background is as an attorney. I started a big firm, but ran a law practice um, two, for four years uh, in venture capital and startup law. So I'm familiar with selling legal services to public and how and why they make those decisions. Mm -hmm. So uh, our target market are millennials in large urban centers. We're launched right now in New York, generating revenue. Um, and we essentially allow uh, regular Americans to, we're empowering regular Americans to solve uh, their legal problems by coming on our site. You can self-diagnose, you pick the package. Um, there's intelligent tools that allow you to do that. And uh, you can get started on your work and uh, have your lawyer get started all at like, well, you can get your lawyer ready to get started at like 2 o'clock in the morning. So it's like the way you buy everything on Amazon that you can buy. Your lawyers. Interesting. Cool. I like it. Yeah. 
Ria? Is that the other right? Ria. 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 Yes, I'm Ria. Ria. Yeah. Come from Japan, uh, Tokyo. Uh, my company's name is Cognity, uh, focused on the human cognition. And uh, uh, we are a tech company, and uh, uh, we have the technology for the removing bias. So already I launched, uh, we launched uh, some products. And the uh, uh, main product is named Brain Pro. Uh, that is a, uh, sorry, that is a brainstorming product. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, we have the uh, intelligent system for detecting the meaning of, of our, uh, what the flow of the logic. And, uh, flow, I'm sorry? Flow, 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 Frogs. Yeah. No, frogs. 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 Yeah. Frogs. 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 Sorry. 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 And uh, uh, which brainstorming tool for the project manager? Uh -huh. uh, and uh, 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 especially software engineer and uh, uh, project of the 39% for the reason of the uh, lack of the perspective. And uh, uh, we uh, we can solve the perspective limited to of the uh, brainstorming. So, and uh, uh, we can show the suggest uh, the other another choice of the uh, if we uh, use a plotting the idea on my product. Uh, that's my work. Okay, yes. okay. Keep working on that. It's it's a little bit longer than <laughs> okay. I mean, that's okay. But that's why we're here. We keep working on it. Um, I'm Riti and I'm in the ideation stage and mm -hmm. my idea is to bring fun in everyday work life. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, most employees today attend on an average 62 meetings a month. That means we get 62 alerts that we have to acknowledge. I see an opportunity to make those alerts more interesting, more fun, and more contextual. More oh, interesting. By introducing audiovisual elements, videography, whatever makes you pepped up throughout the day. Right. Yeah, I, I actually turn my phone off during the day sometimes. I go to airplane mode a lot of times. Right in the middle of the day, I just, like, I can't mm -hmm. deal with. <laughs> yeah, with the alerts and the emails and all of those kinds of things. Um, so interesting. So uh, so great. So I'll go. My name is Scott Sambucci, and I'm the, the founder of Sales Qualia, and our company is focused on improving sales performance. And so we... Um, a lot of the work that we do is with startups. We also work with some other larger companies. And as of uh, my experience, it's about 20 years of selling, starting with selling college textbooks um, back in the late 90s, going from door to door, knocking on, talking to professors about what courses they're teaching, what books they should be using, and then eventually progressing into software uh, in the first kind of internet boom in the late 90s and early 2000s. And I've been out in Silicon Valley since 2002. So I've worked with, uh, so with two different startups, took them from zero revenue to about $2 million in revenue, and then now working with Blend Labs, which is an enterprise technology company for banks in the lending industry, and we're in the process of reaching the first couple million dollars in revenue this year. So um, I think that for me in particular, I think my experience kind of going from zero to some level of revenue might be a good, might be a good place here. For you all, and again, you know, a lot of the stuff that my experience has been is enterprise or business to business sales, and I, I do feel like a lot of what we're going to learn today would be applicable to to your consumer businesses. And with the group being this small, it's, it's so enjoyable to have a group this small because we can do a lot of interaction versus a big 50 or 60 um, sort of training uh, training room. So, any any questions on that? I'm sorry, what your full name and the name of the company? Oh, sure, Scott Simbucci. S-A-M-B-U-C-C-I, and sales, Qualia. Qualia? Q-U-A-L-I-A. It's a philosophical term you can look up on Wikipedia. I was going to say, one of the things we're working on is partnerships as well. And I think it's oh, okay. Where, you know, it, it's more enterprise or it's more, mm -hmm. you know, business to business, but I still have the same, yep. really the same framework. Yeah, you're going to have a... Um, you know, stages of that relationship from introduction at a, an event or through an advisor or through yeah. someone in this group and then eventually pulling them through and actually executing and what's even more interesting I think about from a partnership standpoint is 
a lot of times the partnerships always look good on paper. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, this would be so great. We can promote you and you can promote us and then nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, why did nothing happen here? We yeah. thought it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. So um, there's something in particular we'll spend some time on which I call implementation planning. It's kind of a mouthful. Um, but it talks about creating a roadmap for success, not just to the sale, because I think it's a lot of, and I, I've made this mistake plenty of times where you spend you know, days or weeks or months even getting to a sale and you finally get the contract and you're just sort of like, oh, made it. When it turns out, you're really just starting the relationship. And it's just sort of a psychological thing. You're like, hey, I got the contract signed, we're done. But the psychology should instead be, now we've signed the contract, let's get started because obviously you hope that customer partnership will last decades, mm -hmm. right, for as long as your, your company is around. So, so let's uh, talk through a little bit about uh, some of the objectives today. And you know, I say they're very aggressive objectives because I've scaled this workshop, I've done this over two days even. So there's a lot, a lot of information that we could go through. So um, if we don't get through everything, that's okay. Uh, part, a lot of this content I've also put into an online course where there's like 14 hours of video, which I'll talk later about how you can access that if you want to. And so the idea here is I can't teach you everything about sales. I don't know everything about sales, I know some stuff. Um, my, really my goal is to sort of, I think of it in terms of a sales framework or a sales process. Because if you have, just like with product development, if you have a good framework, you just sort of follow the framework and you learn and you iterate within that framework how you ask questions and how you gain information or if you're in ideation, you're sort of trying a lot of MD, MVPs and coming through um, some customer development, customer discovery interviews. And so the framework is often more important to get started and then you can sort of get into the minutia. So, uh, we'll go through that. We'll talk about different buyer types and what I call sales zombies, which will be particularly important for, uh, for some of the partnership stuff. Talk about value statements, the implementation plan, and then what I call milestones and metrics. So this is sort of like the, the primary focus. We good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oops. Okay. So the, the framework that I like to use is something we developed called the sales model canvas. Have you come across the business model canvas? Mm -hmm. Ad nauseum, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, not again. And so we, we modeled, I say we, I, there's a couple of folks that work for me and my company, uh, Sales Qualia. And so we, we modeled it, the concept after the business model canvas. And the idea here, well, let me ask you, what's the idea of using a business model canvas? Or a lean canvas is another one that's out there. What's, what's the primary objective for using a business model canvas? To have a plan. To have a plan is one, for sure. Mm -hmm. What's another reason you would want to use a business model canvas? To get to your goals. <coughs> consistency. Some consistency mm -hmm. across how you're executing, say, with approaching the customer versus signing a contract. Those are, those are all correct. The other, the other way I think about it is identifying risk mm -hmm. in your business model, right? So where, you know, where in your business are there open questions that if you don't answer those questions, you're facing a pretty big risk. And so the same thing with the sales model canvas where you could have, for example, a great value proposition, really good customer acquisition coming in, but if that on the back end, you're not getting the conversion because you haven't thought through that, or you haven't figured out the right pricing structure, or you haven't thought about bringing somebody from a customer acquisition, you might have hundreds of people come to your site and only certain numbers will convert. You need to figure all those things out. And so the idea of the sales model canvas is just the same where you're identifying the riskiest parts of your sales framework. And so most of what we're going to spend time today is on in that green box because um, as I thought about the time today, because many of you are still very early and in some cases still still determining what the product should be, the, the first part of the, of the canvas, that, that right-hand side, is really focused on that initial touch point with customers, identifying what their needs are, any objections they might have, reasons they might not buy from you, and then as I mentioned, that implementation and support. So once you, you sort of, you need to figure that stuff out first before you need to worry about things like how far do we get through the sale or how do I set up a contract or um, all those other things. So we're going to focus most of our time on the stuff in the green box. Good? Yes? Okay. So this is like the most important thing. If you don't leave here with anything other than this picture cemented in your brain. Mm -hmm. This is the one thing, if I've learned anything, <coughs> is that your customers are lazy cows. So why do I, why do I say that? Because they're 
they're not like looking for you, they're just kind of sitting around. You have to really educate them on product is. Yeah. So. And sometimes they are looking for you. They just don't know that. They either don't know it or they don't take action. Right? I mean, cows are like kind of notoriously stupid too, right? <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think we call it a cow path? So, somebody was telling me when you came in today, you were asked to sort of change your seats around. Mm -hmm. Why? Because these. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, go. No, no. I talk more. <laughs> no, you go. Oh, no. Ping pong. <laughs> um, because um, cause you get into. To, People get into a habit and they just stick with it. They never question it. They never exactly, it. and it's it's like been proven over and over in psychological, whereas it's called path dependency. Organizations struggle with called path dependency. It's why they're called cow paths. Mm -hmm. Have you ever looked at a cow path? Is it ever a straight line? It's very rarely, actually, a straight line. A lot of times, a cow path will kind of meander through a meadow. It's because the first cow walked that way. Maybe because there was like a really cool flower over here, and then there was another flower here, and then one over there. And then the next cow was like, oh, I should just follow that path. And before you know it, you have this cow path across the field that's not always very straight. Mm -hmm. And that's, the cows are notoriously dumb. Mm -hmm. And they just sort of like follow the herd. And they're just like, okay, I'm here to graze grass. And then they hear a bell, and then they will go in and eat some oats or grain or whatever they eat, I don't know. And so your customers are the same way. It's not their fault. It's just that's who we are as human beings, right? And so if, if we don't do things like, hey, make sure you switch your spots, you'll just naturally default into what you did before. You have your own path of dependency. That's why a lot of us have morning routines. I have a morning routine and I follow it religiously. My wife yesterday said, you know, sometimes you follow your routine so much, I feel like the routines are more important than like what we're doing every day. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, you're right. Actually, sometimes I fall into this mindset where I have to do this thing and then this thing and this thing if I don't have my coffee. If I don't eat a banana while I'm eating coffee, while I'm drinking coffee, I sort of feel like my morning wasn't fulfilled. Like I, I eat a banana every morning with my coffee. It's just one of these things I do. Um, it's very weird. I just like fell into this habit. And so your companies are the same way. And so whether it's a partnership or your individual uh, customers, this idea of developing eventually, a little bit later on, we'll talk about the difference between implicit needs and explicit needs. But this idea that as a company or as individuals, a lot of times they will just sort of like fall into a very risk averse, habitual sense of behavior. And so it's our job, a lot of times as a salesperson, it's, it's almost like kind of pulling the rope. Sometimes you're pulling the rope and sometimes you're using a little bit of honey or carrots to pull, you know, get the, get the horse to water as they say, or coming up with some creative ways so that the people that you're working with are actually taking those actions on their own, feeling like it's their own idea. So, so we're done. That's it. That's all you need to know. So the the sales canvas. So let's kind of start sort of diving into into some of these. So the first thing that I like to think about, and I put customer needs in the middle because that's I mean your customer needs are first and foremost, first and foremost, and that's because nobody cares about your product. Right. Nobody cares about your product. Deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we know this. It's, um, it's sort of, and it's, and, and I love this Homer Simpson quote, Simpson quote. It's not because they don't care. They just, it's not that they don't understand. It's just that they, don't, they frankly don't care because they're everybody's busy and everybody's busy and they're getting busier, which is why you're getting 62 meeting alerts every single week. Um, I'm surprised it's that low. Sometimes it feels. Yeah, it can go under. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and so it's annoying. It's very annoying. <laughs> and what's supposed to be a positive sort of reminder, like, hey, don't forget this meeting, turns into like, oh my God, I have like, meeting number 62 today. Right. Or this week. Or and this we month. just condition this one, just click it, we want click it. Yep, exactly. To the point where it doesn't even have an effect anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And then you ignore it, and then you miss a meeting, and you're like, ah. So, the, you know, whatever your product is, it doesn't really matter. It's what the customer needs are. This idea that I've got this, this, in your case, getting these alerts that I'm ignoring, or they're annoying, or whatever, whatever the reasons are. So, when you're thinking about the positioning of your product, and we'll talk about this more with value statements, you want to think about it in terms of the customer's needs than talking about what the product does. And so, um, particularly at enterprises, and you can you can argue the difference between 
business to business selling and, and business to consumer selling. Um, you know, business to consumer sometimes, you, you, you've ever heard of selling, uh, selling towards the seven deadly sins. So in marketing, a lot of times for consumer stuff, um, I've heard marketing people talk about if, if, if you can market to the seven deadly sins, then you can sort of, that's how consumers sometimes will make impulsive types of purchases. Um, there's, some, there's a marketing consultant I know who actually teaches people how to do this. Which is, you know, even that I sort of, sort of like sometimes question because at the end of the day you might get somebody to, to make a purchase, but they may not become a customer in the sense that they're repeating. And you've got a nice partnership with that person, you're helping them solve that problem. Um, so instead, what, what I like to think about is why people at enterprises buy are usually for these four, one of these four reasons. Sometimes it's a combination of, of the two. And sometimes, like for example, saying like decreasing cost is also going to increase my efficiency, or increasing my efficiency will decrease cost. Sometimes they're hand in hand, but typically there's one primary reason and then sometimes a secondary reason. Uh, occasionally there's a third, a tertiary reason. And so um, increase revenue. What do we what do we mean by that? Profits. Profits. Sometimes profits. Sometimes just top line revenue. People just want to acquire more customers. They want to acquire more revenue. They don't really necessarily care about profit as much as they care about growing their company and then figuring out how to turn profitability on the road. Um, the second decreasing cost is pretty self-explanatory. So if your product helps a company very specifically decrease costs, increasing efficiency. Um, so this one's a little harder. Like, what's an example of increasing efficiency that may be different than, say, decreasing costs or something? Mm -hmm. Productivity. Um, Keep going. What's an example? Like, just make one up. Um, how to uh, how to um, do your expenses better. Or more quickly, more right? Quickly. So Expensify, great example, perfect example. So we, have you heard of Expensify? It's a, it's a mobile app with a web app. And Sounds good though. I need that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's really cool, right? So um, here's how it works, right? So in our, in our company at <laughs> Blend, we use uh, Expensify. And you can, it does this thing called Smart Scan, where you take a picture of your receipt, and then it actually reads the data on the receipt and knows with like 99% accuracy what you bought and how much it was. And then you can just right there assign it to an account and then you're done. So at the end of the month when you want to do your expense report, it's basically done for you. You just have to review a few of the transactions. And then you can do other stuff like integrate your, your credit card. So if you're using an Amex or something and you give it permission to access your Amex account, so it pulls in those transactions. So that's per, a perfect example of increasing efficiency because it's it's not really, de I mean, yeah, it's decreasing my cost because it's I, maybe I spend like an hour less per week doing expense reports, but I'm not going to think about that as like, wow, that's really going to move my business forward. Um, so Expensify is a great example of increasing efficiency, both on the, on the consumer side, but if you're using it individually, or Mint.com, for example, anybody use Mint.com? Mm -hmm. Great example of increasing efficiency as a consumer app. I can just log in, or even better, I get these alerts, which sometimes I know like more, you know, unusual spending. I'm like, yeah, because something broke in my house, and it knows that I never go to the hardware store. And all of a sudden, I spent like $500 in the hardware store on usual spending. Like, thank you for reminding me that the roof is broken. Um, but same idea, right? It's, it's making my life more efficient because otherwise, I'd have to pull in all this data from my bank account, my credit card, my 401k, and try to figure out what is my financial position. Instead, I can just one click and get these reports. So, um, so increasing efficiency and then decreasing risk. Um, that was it. Okay. It looks like my cat, too. I have two cats. One of them looks like this. Um, her name is Ziva, and uh, she kind of needs this helmet sometimes, actually. What, um, what do we mean by decreasing risk? What's an example? Because this one can be hard sometimes to really zero in on what we need. Insurance. Insurance is a good, is, is a very clear, like, decrease mm -hmm. risk. Buy health insurance, buy homeowner's insurance, therefore you'll decrease risk. How about from a business sense, or something might be a little bit trickier, like in your products, 
that you're thinking about right now. I mean, one of the things that we saw with you was that your terms of service on a privacy policy, which we can structure to decrease the risk of um, getting sued in your business and losing lawsuits or violating regulations. Yeah, and is that like a core component of your product that other people don't offer? Yeah, I mean, we have a, well, not necessarily, but I mean, like, that's, I guess that's not a core feature of our product that makes us unique, but that is a feature of that particular product. Mm -hmm. We offer it in a more unique way, but that's a feature of that product that will ultimately decrease your business's risk. Yep. So it may not be the primary reason why somebody buys. Mm -hmm. It could be a nice little at the end, like, oh, by the way, not only will we decrease your costs or make them more predictable or will increase your efficiency, oh, by the way, we're also going to decrease your business risk. Like, I might not come to your business specifically because I'm thinking every day, like, I've got to decrease risk, I've got to decrease risk, right. so I'm going to buy your product. Could be a nice marketing sort of at the end. That's actually the only reason anybody buys that product. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. You, that, that's the only reason people put terms of service and privacy policies on their site is to decrease the risk, and then it becomes a question of where do I get it from and who do I get it from and why, which largely becomes a cost and a speed question then. So maybe I didn't understand the, the product that you're selling. Oh, so we sell flat fee legal on demand. Flat so, fee legal on demand. Um, yeah, so performed by a lawyer. Um, so when you put up a website or an app and you need to put a terms of service and a privacy policy, and you have okay. a lot of questions like, you know, what do I have to do with private information? Um, what does my you know, return policy? Okay, so you're focused on that part of legal. Well, actually, I mean, we're a full service um, okay. consumer facing brand. So, um, so we're experts at flat fee pricing. We're mm -hmm. not, you know, each, each, Area is staffed by lawyers who are expert. I'm oh, sorry, at that in that area. So I could come to you to incorporate my business. I could come to you to business. help me with a real estate transaction, or exactly. I could come to you to put a terms of service on my website. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, a small business and a personal training for a personal bankruptcy, right. for a contested divorce, for a person. Uh, what else do we have? You got fired, and you want someone to look at your termination agreement before you yep. sign it. That's a popular mm -hmm. one. Got it. Things like that. Okay. Yeah. So what's interesting about that, what you just described, is that it seems like based on the vertical or the market segmentation, mm -hmm. your target market or the service that's being provided in this mm -hmm. case, in, in some cases the risk may be the main reason. Like, mm -hmm. hey, I'm, I'm launching a website, I want to make sure my terms of service is all wrapped up and clean. Mm -hmm. So yes, risk is the most important thing, because if mm -hmm. I screw that up and public data or private data goes public, yeah. right in the water. On the other hand, I might want to do flat fee pricing to incorporate my business with you mm -hmm. because it's like a very clear predictable cost decision for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I could go and engage with, you know, Wilson Sensini and pay them five thousand dollars to do an LLC for me. <laughs> or I could do flat fee pricing and find it for five hundred bucks. Yeah. Right? So that's clearly a cost. The only reason that anyone will ever hire a lawyer though to do something because people think they can do a lot of things themselves if they have no choice but to hire a lawyer, which is very that only occurs in a few times in a few cases. Um, it's pretty much always because um, you're buying law, law for peace of mind or to decrease the risk. Because mm -hmm. um, I can do it myself, but I might do it wrong, and the next Y and Z will happen, so I'm going to have a lawyer do it so I have peace of mind. Yeah. Um, and so scaring people and explaining to them all the terrible things that can happen to them is very important in selling legal services. Yeah, I agree. And I also feel like there's cases where, like when I incorporated my business, I was just looking, like I knew I needed to incorporate. <laughs> like it wasn't that I wanted to, that decision was to decrease mm -hmm. risk. Using the right law firm, the right law partner, was a cost decision for me. Right. And in fact, I, I negotiated with a person, my personal attorney, who helped me with some other employer stuff that I had in the past, mm -hmm. and said, "Hey, you know, I really like you to do this. What's can you do a best price for me?" And she knocked off like fifty percent. She did it for me anyway, and it was really great. So that's why I decided to use her. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a pretty typical. So it was a cost decision for me. Because yeah. I already sort of knew that I needed to, this risk decision was already made prior to what product I was going to buy. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's why I say sometimes the risk may be top mm -hmm. if it's terms of service. In other cases, the risk may not be the most important reason why somebody buys your product. Why didn't you just do the, the corporation yourself, though? For efficiency's sake. Right. So time. Yeah. Or like I knew, like, yeah, I'm going to go into a corporation. I'm going to be consulting with people. And I built software down the road. Mm -hmm. And so... Like that, it was almost like two decisions. It was one decision like, yes, I know I need to do this this legal entity to protect myself and the company. Mm -hmm. So that was a so that was like a separate decision before mm -hmm. I decided where to get those services. Mm -hmm. So after I made that decision, then the place where I went was a place where I knew it would be efficient and relatively cost efficient. Mm -hmm. so. It's pretty typical, that process, for what we sell. Yeah, okay. Might a guarantee be an example of decreasing risk for the consumer as well? So a guarantee is, this is interesting because I just got this question uh, 
last month at a different workshop I did. So the guarantee is, it's not part of your, it's not the reason somebody would buy your product. It sort of would give them some peace of mind after the purchasing decision is made. Like, hey, if it doesn't work, we'll give you 100% money back guarantee or something. Or, um, you know, if we don't help you convert your leads by 20% higher, then, you know, we'll cancel your subscription, something like that. The guarantee usually isn't, people don't go out and say, hey, I want to buy this product, and I'm only going to buy a product that has a guarantee, or that's the reason that I bought this product. There's usually some other more explicit need 